we have a good sense of what raising a number to a natural power means through repeated multiplication. Using this definition provides us with a handful of useful properties that when assumed to govern all of the exponents whatsoever, actually allow us to extend this definition beyond only the positive integers. We can define negative exponents as something that should subtract off with the positive ones, actually making them reciprocals of the positive exponents. We can go even further and recall that roots actually cancel out with the natural exponents, that is, they get them to become the power of 1, and so what it means is that we can actually interpret them as rational exponents that will just multiply out, that is cancel out, with the regular natural exponents. We can extend our definition to irrational exponents too, we can just approximate the value approaching them in the limit as the exponent approaches the desired irrational number, and we'll stop soon enough to be able to assume that the achieved power can be expressed as a fraction. Complex exponents, however, don't make sense like at all, because what would 3 to the power of i, for example, mean? Well, not multiplying 3 by itself i times. <laughs> the answer I used to be given revolves around the Euler's formula, which I made a video on, by the way, and it means that whenever we're trying to calculate 3 to the power of i, we actually interpret it as e to the power of the natural log of 3 to the power of i, we bring that exponent of i down in front of the natural log in the exponent of i, and then use the Euler's formula to write it as cosine of the ln of 3 plus i times sine of ln of 3, and we get, well, a numerical answer indeed. But it never really satisfied me. I don't want to be plugging mindlessly some stuff into an obscure formula, I want to know where it comes from and I want to know what it means. Also, a weird thing happens here. So, when I plot 3 to the power of i, it lands on the unit circle. And is 3 some kind of a lucky magical base such that its i-th power lives on the unit circle? Well, it isn't. When I implode 4 to the power of i, 5 to the power of i, 7 to the power of i, 562 to the power of i, for God's sake, it all lives on the unit circle. Why is that? First of all, I would like to talk about the multiplication in the complex realm. So, imagine a real valued number line, you know, the usual one. And now mark some point on it, and now take the vector connecting the point 0 to that marked number on the number line. Well, what can I do to that vector? I can multiply it by some scalar that will hopefully stretch it or maybe squish it, well, depending on the value of the scalar that it choose. The important thing though is that whenever I multiply my vector by a positive number, its direction does not change, but when I choose a negative scalar, it's going to rotate 180 degrees. And so multiplying a vector by a positive number doesn't change its direction, but multiplying it by a negative number rotates it by a pi. But now what if I multiply my vector by i, the square root of negative 1? The direction can be unchanged and it can rotate 180, because i is neither positive nor negative, so the resulting vector has to lie somewhere in between. A unit vector in the positive x direction pointing at the number 1 after scaling by i has to be pointing at the point i, and so it's rotated by 90 degrees. So for that particular vector, multiplying it by i corresponds to a 90 degree rotation about the origin. It's actually true for all of its scaled versions, and we'll use it later. Now, totally out of the blue, it's true, consider a particle whose position on the number line is modeled by the function e to the power of 2 times t. Now, by chain rule, we get that its speed at any given point in time is going to be twice as big as the distance it has already traveled across the number line. On the other hand, consider some of the particle whose position is modeled by e to the negative 1 half times t. Its velocity vector is going to be, first of all, pointing in the opposite direction to its position vector, and it's going to be half its length. But now take a third particle here, and let's say its position is being modeled by e to the power of i times t. Now, how is its velocity vector gonna look like? It's going to be i times e to the i times t. And since we know that any vector multiplied by i rotates a 90 degrees, 
we know is going to be perpendicular to the position vector. And now, in order for all this to make sense, we have to move to the complex row. We now know that for any given point, the velocity vector is going to be perpendicular to the position vector. And if we now draw it out for every single position we might come across, we will get a vector field. And we will particularly care about the initial position of one unit to the right. Because if we start there, the position vector is going to make a unit circle around the origin. And now we can finally solve the mystery of the unit circle. So what we really did by interpreting some number to the power of i as e to the power of the i times the natural log of that number was letting the particle move along the unit circle until the clock hits time equal to the natural log of that number. So that would be pretty much all I have to say for today. I really, really hope I gave you some nice intuition on how to think about complex exponents. If I did, you're happy, I'm happy, everyone's happy. The world's a better place now, I guess. And hopefully, see you in the next one.